Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Thursday edition of um, Video Clips. And I almost forgot what I was doing here for a minute. So many things on my mind. Welcome to the Thursday edition of Video Clips. Now that sounds a lot stronger. All right, so um, I've advised against genetic, t genetic testing for most people in most situations for a lot of reasons. Um, I want to qualify what I'm going to talk about today by saying there's usefulness for genetic testing. It's the widespread, lets everybody get tested for something that is bothersome to me. Uh, the test results and a lot of noise, identifying mutations from the meaning of which we don't know. It's widely acknowledged that the tests can turn people into what is commonly referred to as the worried well. Um, and these are people who are healthy but now become concerned because they find out that they have a genetic mutation. And the reality is that most people who have genetic mutations do not develop the diseases for which they're genetically predisposed. Um, Another thing, and I did a video clip on this last year, research shows that knowing about predisposition doesn't lead to behavior change. So we might be making people a whole lot more worried, but if you follow up with people who've been told that they're predisposed to develop a disease, as it turns out, it doesn't really seem to make much difference in their behavior. More and more women are getting tested for the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, which do lead to action, by the way. That test does lead women to take action. A lot of women decide to have prophylactic mastectomy and or oophorectomy, but some studies show that this doesn't really result in significant reduction in the risk of dying of, of cancer. So genetic testing, in my opinion, just hasn't been proven to change health out outcomes or to guide treatments most of the time for the better, and in some cases make things worse instead of better. Unfortunately, interest in genetic testing remains really high. And in response, the popular and very well advertised 23andMe at home DNA test now offers a genetic health risk report for BRCA1 and 2 selected variants. The test identifies women at increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer and men who are at increased risk of prostate cancer. Now this sounds wonderful. From the comfort of your home, you can get this done. You don't have to make an appointment and go to a medical center and all that sort of thing. But there are a lot of misunderstandings regarding this test. One is that the three variants that the company tests for are most commonly found in people of Ashkenazi Jewish descent and are not the same variants that are found in the general population. This means the test is useless for most people who take it. The other is that many media reports and online sites state that the test is FDA approved, but it's actually not. The FDA has classified the 23andMe test as a medical device class two. Now there's an important distinction here because class one and two devices include things like dental floss, elastic bandages, condoms, and powered wheelchairs. These devices are clearly not considered high risk, and so the FDA doesn't want to go to all the trouble to evaluate and issue findings and that sort of thing. Um, class 3 devices, on the other hand, which would include things like implants, um, do require FDA approval, although I will refer you to another article in the Health Race Library about um, this issue. I made a video clip on this earlier this year that the, the FDA looks at very few of the Class 3 devices. Well, the incorrect assumption that the FDA has approved the 23andMe DNA test, I think, has probably led a lot of people to have the test and to put a lot more um, weight into its findings than they would if they just thought this was some fun thing on TV, which is usually the way 23andMe is advertised. Now the FDA hasn't approved the test as I mentioned, but I did find online it's required that 23andMe put quote general and special controls in place to reduce identified risks such as false negatives and false positive test results and incorrect or poor interpretation of test results. In a 13 page document, the FDA has given the company a very long list of those special controls which include labeling requirements such as a warning statement that accurately conveys the limitations of the test in layman's terms. These include that the test does not detect all of the variants that increase the risk of cancer, and that the variants detected by the test almost always occur in people of the Ashkenazi Jewish descent. The FDA requires that people be informed that few will actually benefit from having the test. Another one is the label must disclose that anxiety is a common response to test results. That's the worried well kind of thing that I was talking about earlier. And that people should discuss whether or not to get the test with their doctors prior to ordering it. And then notification that the test should not be used, of course, to make any medical de decision. The biggest beneficiary of this test really is 23andMe, not consumers. Both non-Ashkenazi Jewish men and women and people who aren't Jewish are being tested for mutations they're highly unlikely to carry. 
People who test negative for the mutations might breathe a sigh of relief, but their feelings of relief are really ill-founded because if their health status is not so good because they don't practice good diet and lifestyle habits, they can still be at very high risk of cancer. And that's indeed one of the major problems I have with a lot of the screening tests and, and uh, genetic tests and that sort of thing is people saying, oh, well, I don't have the, gen the genetic predisposition for cancer and I haven't been diagnosed with cancer, so everything must just be fabulous. Well, a lot of people think everything is fabulous and then they find out they have cancer, so that's not really true. On the other hand, a Jewish woman who tests positive for the mutations might indeed be at higher risk for cancer, but can be herded into the medical mill for prophylactic surgery, which does actually reduce the risk of cancer breast cancer, but it does not reduce the risk of dying of breast cancer. I mean, there's like a 3% difference 10 years out um, between women who do and do not have prophylactic mastectomy as a result of uh, being tested. You know, it's one thing to advertise how much fun it is to find out that you're really 25% Native American or that your father's side of the family is from Russian descent. It's quite something else to advertise a test for gene mutations that has dubious values at best and can potentially lead to harm. So I clearly advise against having this test for the reasons that I've stated. All right, so we're going to end the week on a happy note. You know me, I like any excuse to promote exercise. I still say it's the hardest thing to get people to do. I mean, I don't know if what we have to do, tie them up, put them in the trunk, haul them to the gym. <laughs> kidnap them, threaten them, whatever. We've tried some of those things. It's like, you know, how much prodding and poking do you have to do to get people to work out? Well, here's some incentive for doing it. A growing body of evidence is showing that what's good for the heart is good for the brain. And this is true for exercise, which is very good for the heart and cardiovascular system and also protective against Alzheimer's disease. A newly published longitudinal study that followed women for up to 44 years concluded that women who achieved and maintained a high level of cardiovascular physical fitness in middle age had an 88% lower risk of developing dementia as they aged. Fit women who did develop dementia developed it an average of 11 years later than women who were moderately fit. So I love when we find that dose dependent effect. So the average age was 90 instead of 79. Now I don't wanna have dementia when I'm 90. You probably don't either, but 90 is better than 79. And just think what would happen if you started exercising and eating right early on, you know, you could, you could die with your mind intact and have a full life until you die. Well, this study is consistent with many others that have shown the benefit of exercise for improved cognition. A study including 81 older subjects, some normal and some cognitively impaired, showed that a higher level of cardiorespiratory fitness was positively associated with better white matter fiber integrity and better executive function. Another study of over a thousand subjects found that poor cardiovascular fitness and exaggerated exercise blood pressure and heart rate responses in middle-aged adults was predictive of smaller brain volume two decades later. The researchers concluded, quote, promotion of midlife cardiovascular fitness may be an important step toward ensuring healthy brain aging and body aging, I would add to that. Another group of researchers evaluated genetic risk factors and fitness for 95 late middle-aged subjects and concluded that cardiorespiratory fitness reduced the impact of genetic predisposition for Alzheimer's disease. Now, the reason I wanted to include this study when I found it is I think that people really sometimes underestimate the power of diet and lifestyle changes. So if you have bad predisposition, you have a lot of diseases that run in your family, good habits can override the bad genes. The other, the other side is also true. You can have a great genetic profile and not be at high risk for much at all, and bad habits can override your great genetic profile. So anyway, if you're pre predisposed genetically to develop Alzheimer's disease, exercise can help you overcome that. Researchers examined 877 subjects participating in the Austrian Stroke Prevention Study and evaluated their cardiorespiratory fitness and cognitive function. Better CR function was associated with better memory, executive function, and motor skills, regardless of the presence of white matter lesions and brain atrophy. So even if you have done some damage through bad eating and a lot of the things that we've all done at one point in time, exercising can help overcome that. You can even overcome structural changes to the brain. Now there is a known mechanism of action that explains the positive effect of exercise on cognitive function. Exercise increases the production of something called brain-derived neurotropic factor, or BDNF, which assists in brain cell communication and cognition. 
Research shows that higher BDNF expression is associated with slower cognitive decline and better executive function and memory. So here's the bottom line. Exercise offers a lot of protections against the ravages of aging, which don't have to be ravages at all if we do the right things. I mean, it builds strength and balance and coordination and stamina. And those are required for both quality of life and also for independence. I mean, the number one pe reason people end up in nursing homes is that they become frail. Um, these studies show it helps to main, maintain cog cognitive skills as well. And I think that a strong body and a strong mind can result in a great, hopefully long life. Um, I think we get sometimes focused on how great longevity is in our country and we're not really focused enough on the quality of life. I mean, it's one thing to live to be 95. Another thing is to consider how much of that 95 year span of life is really high quality versus how much of it is spent degenerating. I want the least amount of time spent degenerating as possible and the most amount of time of high quality of life. And I think that's probably what you're looking for too. All right, well, that's all for today and all for the week. As usual, pass this on to anybody who you think might enjoy watching it, and I will be back to you next week with more news.